Wow, it's a wonderful Sunday morning, oh, afternoon. So, uh, without further ado, let's uh, dive into today's um, story. Uh, continuously from last Sunday, uh, we were, you know, uh, talking about how God uh, sell through, um, you know, two different kinds of offerings from uh, Cain and Abel. So, uh, from today's uh, starting verse, as 8, let's start from ver uh, verse 8. Let's read uh, verse 8 again together. Ready? Go. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Uh, when you have to read the Bible, you have to read it carefully. Uh, I'm not joking. You have to picturize it. You have to see through things. What's behind the curtain? What's the true meaning inside the, you know, even one word or one verse. And as Cain spoke to Abel, to his brother, and actually, it has long been uh, observed that this verse, eight, you know, verse 8, like the part Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field. This verse leaves out what Cain actually said to his brother. Verse 8 simply reads, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, when they were in the field. Let's stop here for a second, uh, uh, you know, about verse 8. Actually, we need to picturize this scene. Let's think it as like, uh, you know, movie scene, right? So, wouldn't it be better to read verse 8 uh, this way? Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, let's picturize it saying like, let's go out to the field. I think, wouldn't it be better to understand, instead of Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, when they were in the field. Actually, uh, it has more uh, relevance uh, to, uh, you know, in between two uh, sentences. So, do you think Cain spoke to Abel in a positive way or negative way? If it were the positive, he wouldn't have killed uh, Abel, his brother. But so much with the negative, Cain spoke to Abel, let us go out to the field. Plus, the word spoke in Hebrew, Amar. What did I say? Amar. It means, yes, Amar, thank you, Amar, right? It means exalt or praise in a positive way, but when it's conversely rendered, I mean negatively, it is meant to be despised or holding contempt to or be angry or dislike, right? Having hatred uh, against someone, right? So when Cain had to speak to Abel, he badly disliked his brother, Abel. He literally despised Abel. It's pretty interesting, huh? To uncover another meaning of Omar is C. I said C. So verse 8 again, with a different meaning. Cain, let me read it with a different meaning. Cain saw Abel in contempt. Okay? Cain saw Abel in contempt when they were in the field. It's better to understand, right? So when Cain spoke to Abel, it was intentional. Cain had a plan for Abel. As a third different meaning of spoke Amar, it stands for look for someone or look for something. So let me read it. In other words, Cain looked for Abel when they were in the field. Again, uh, this is that's to say, Cain walked through the field 
looking for Abel, just as God walked through the garden looking for Adam. Cain walked through the field looking for Abel to do what? Hmm? Intentionally to kill Abel, right? Cain walked through the field looking for Abel to rise up against his brother Abel and kill him. To kill in Hebrew is harach, right? Harach. This is the common verb meaning to murder intentionally. It has consistency, right? So Cain walked through the field looking for Abel to rise up against his brother Abel and kill him intentionally. It's a manslaughter linked to the sixth commandment. What is the sixth commandment? Do not mm -mm. kill. Do not yes, do not kill. <laughs> Yay! Do not murder. Yeah. Thank you. Cain's reaction to the re, uh, Cain's reaction to the rejection of his offering from God is much more severe than either of his parents' reactions when they were confronted by God after their trespass, after their uh, mistakes, or after their sin. Adam and Eve resort to making excuses. Not me. If, if the serpent, right? They were busy making excuses and self-exoneration. Yeah. And there's always a reason, you know, for doing, for me to do that, right? Self-exoneration. But at least, they do not put themselves into violence like Cain. Let me repeat it. But at least Adam and Eve, they didn't do put themselves into violence like Cain. Unable to control his resentment and bitterness, Cain shows his wrath on the only possible scapegoat, Abel. Abel was his target to kill. The reason Abel is murdered is because of his unchecked envy and jealousy on Cain's part. Rather than accept God's decision, he rejects the one God has accepted. This is true to ourselves nowadays, right? So, when we have unchecked envy, or when we have unchecked jealousy on our part, how to respond? Hit the ceiling? And do some martial arts? You know, having hatred in content with your younger brother? No, 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 not your, your younger brother, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, we can control ourselves uh, on our own. Even when God accepts the other person, right? Even when God accepts your dad, even when God accepts your mom, even when God accepts your brothers or sisters or your relatives or your friends. But you can't control yourself because your feelings and your heart is, isn't unchecked. You allowed your envy, you allowed your jealousy on your part. That's why we have to watch out. Always, whenever we are surrounded with our jealousy or with our envy. That does not come from God. But this reaction only worsens Cain's dilemma. He has, a, he has killed Abel. He has eliminated Abel, but what will he do with God? Whenever we do something wrong, there's, there's a tendency we don't think about God's punishment, God's wrath, God's reaction toward us. Because we are obsessed with our feelings, our envy, our jealousy that might bother us, that might hinder us to see God and His presence. 
What is your day? What is your lifestyle? What is your reaction when you have envy, when you have jealousy on your part, when you want to uh, harm someone, when you want to treat someone who has harmed you? Let's go to verse 9. Let's read it together, verse 9. Ready? Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? Oh dear. Okay, 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 here. Let me cut it. So then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? God intentionally said to Cain, huh? Where is Abel, your brother? It's God's investigation. As in Genesis chapter 3, God's question is quite legitimate. Where is Abel, your brother? Like, like in chapter 3, like, uh, you know, Adam and Eve, where are you, right? So, uh, here in chapter 4, uh, you know, uh, God is uh, questioning uh, Cain. Where is Abel, your brother? The first part of Cain's response is what? I don't know. He lied to God. He doesn't know? No, he knew. Right? He said to his brother, Abel, and when they were in the field, he rose against his brother. He killed him, right? The second part of that response is as a rejection of God's question. A rejection of God's questions. Am I my brother's what? Am I my brother's keeper? Right? Am I my brother's keeper? It's clear, crisp, clear rejection against God's question. This verb, keep, uh, often appears in the Old Testament to describe God's relationship to Israel. He is Israel's keeper, and uh, as such, he never slumbers or slips, right? He's as always toward his beloved uh, people of him, you know, Israel. He never slips, he never slumbers. How about Moses? His prayer for the people of Israel is that the Lord bless them and keep them. Wow, I can't imagine. As a leader, it's hard to have this uh, blessful heart, you know, uh, full of love toward their you know, people. So to keep means not only to preserve or sustain, but to control or regulate or exercise authority over something or something. So for this reason today, we say that zoos or prisons have their keepers, right? There always are keepers. That is certain individuals who have authority over the occupants. So, Cain is called to be his brother's what? Keeper? No. Cain is called to be his brother's lover. Let me repeat that again. Cain is called to be his brother's lover. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty simple. But sometimes it's painstaking. Can you do that? Can you love someone who harmed you, who mistreated you, mistreated you? It's not our ideal thinking, right? So in the way of human beings thinking, so we want to repay, right? Okay, I want to hit you even seven times harder. Boom, boom, boom. You know. So, uh, it may be that uh, Kenya is but disclaiming responsibility 
for knowing angles and their abouts. So thus, he is a liar and evasive. He cannot uh, flee away from, right? And indifferent about his brother. And when he was questioned by God, Yahweh. Uh, from uh, verse 10 to 12, God now shifts his role from interrogator to that of prosecutor. What have you done? So, beforehand, he uh, questioned him, where is your brother Abel now as prosecutor? In the position of prosecutor, he says, what have you done? God is currently making an accusation, not seeking information. Where were you? What did you do? But he said, what have you done? So Abel spilled blood, cries from the ground. And the book of uh, Hebrew, chapter 11, 4, it reads, and through his faith, through uh, though he died, he still speaks. So a concept reflected uh, like this. So it is heard by God. The blood is heard by God. So we think that when when we do something wrong, actually we just take a tour. We just turn around. Uh, okay, there's no one else around me. I'll go ahead, uh, I will do what I want to do, do something wrong against God, believing that there's no one seeing me or seeing through me, you know. But Hebrew 11.4, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. God is alive. He's in control of everything. The shed blood of Abel simply cries out to God and leaves the matter with him. Presumably, presumably it is for vindication that Abel, Abel's blood cries out, for Cain is now blood guilty, right? He's blood guilty. He is liable for God's punishment for shedding blood. It's implicit in this concept of blood guilt is the idea that acts generate consequences. What? Acts generate consequences. As a reader, we may be surprised that God does not kill Cain for his obvious crime. Instead, Cain is banned from the soil, which obviously means not that he is barred from contact with the soil, but from enjoyment of its productivity, according to verse 12. Let's go to verse 12. Um, ready? Go. When you work the ground, you shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Yes. Acts generate consequences. He forgives, but we are to be responsible for what we have done. Uh, the empire of verse 12, you shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. He will become a wandering fugitive. Both of these nouns are aptly chosen to describe Cain's punishment, for they each describe the swaying motion of something like weeds or trees. Right? You just think about the you know uh, weeds and trees when it's blown by the you know uh, wind. It just a strongly upright? No, it sways back and forth, right? Very shaky, right? So, the book of 1 Kings, verse 14 and 15, the Lord 
will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. Isaiah 24 20 the earth staggers like a drunken man it sways like a hut. This then is Cain's fate. In some ways it is a fate worse than death. His life somehow is worse than death. You know, um, since sin came to the world, we are living on earth somehow worse than being dead, right? Lest we are not centered on the Christ, on Christ. So even when ourselves is okay this is my life I have my life I have my money I have my family I have this beauty I have did this health I have this smartness all are mine but when you are away from God because we are always follow after our plans because we want to be perfect in our lives. So I remember the terminology like, uh, what is that? YOLO? You know the term YOLO? What is that? Thank you. You only live once. I know somehow it's very, very good for some people, but as for me, somehow it derives or it stems from, you know, uh, like humanity. You know, our life is not for God. Our life is for human beings, for my own. So, I want to do what I want to do. God, you are you step back there. Whenever I call you, whenever I talk to you, whenever I, you know, Facebook message you, stay there. I don't need you anymore. Because I'm centered on my own. My life is mine. That life is worsened, getting worse and worse and worse. When you don't have your God as your true Lord, you are going astray. So, like Cain, he couldn't, he should have controlled his envy, his unchecked envy or jealousy on his part, but his life of, of his mind, right? He just went on his own, not thinking about God's part, God's way. So it is to lose all sense of belonging and identification with a community. So what if you don't have your right card you 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 have to go to the hospital but if you don't have your audit card what happens you don't have the proper treatment or you have to pay a lot of money compared comparatively to the people with their own id card right so it is to become ruthless it is become detached from the community also at the same time when you don't have your rootness, when you don't have your identity in the kingdom of God, you are a thousand miles away, even detached, you know, astronomically. We have, we, we are living in the middle of COVID, so it's our daily routine, keeping social distancing, but at the same time, are you good at keeping your divine distancing, your spiritual distancing from God? Oh, God, did you put on your mask? Did you wear your mask when you come to me? If not, please, no thank you. I don't want to see you anymore. I want to keep a distance, this spiritual, you know, distancing makes you worse and worse somehow than uh, 
you know, uh, worse than being dead. So we should view the character of Cain not uh, so much as a villain, but as a tragic character. Cain, once a farmer, is now left out from civilization and is to become a, a vagabond. So ruthlessness is the punishment from God and the wilderness is the refuge of sin, of sinner. Verse 13 and 14, let's read verse 13 and 14. Ready? Go. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Unlike Cain, oh, unlike Adam, who offers no uh, protest against his expulsion, his exemption from the garden, Cain presents, Cain shows before the Lord his grievance, grievance, I mean, when his sentence is announced from God, in his opinion, the judgment is too harsh. In effect, Cain suggests that his punishment is fourfold. First, there will be only few return from the soil. Okay? When he works on the ground, he will get nothing, almost nothing, right? Number two. But the second thing is, he will be hidden from God's face. Getting worse, right? And the third one, he is forced into a life of fugitive wonder earth. Your man life. So he will be open game for anybody who meets him. They can kill him freely. The fourth one, he who killed his own brother now gets worried or fret lest someone kill him. So let's go to verse 15. Ready? Go. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills him, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold, and the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. So we now encounter a drastic or a dramatic turnout in this story. So Cain, who has been receiving words of judgment, but now he receives a word of God's promise and an act of God's protection. Amen. Amen. So when you feel like you are going away from God, you are drifted up to somewhere you are unknown. You are of, you are unknown of. So, but don't forget to think that God is with you. God wants to bless you. God wants to uh, see you coming back. Cause God loves you so much. Even we are just fighting this uh, dark fight during this pandemic. So let's allow God to come to us and touch our hearts and inspire us, not through our own thinking, but through the Word of God. So only through these living words of God, we can be transformed. This is not our power. This is not our knowledge, but only the divine, His, His knowledge. His wisdom is way beyond our imagination. So I want you to take your time and just think about yourself and what you've been through for your life so far. And so the following week, 
So I want you to experience God's power, God's plan, God's big picture for your life. Even in this pandemic, you can still taste the goodness and the gentleness of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with our eternal dead. Lord, not only up in heaven, but also down here on earth, you're always with us, wanting to protect us, wanting to lead us into the right path. But the thing is, we are tempted in so many ways. Sometimes we have hatred toward our significant ones, a loving parents or our uh, loving uh, brothers and sisters or relatives or some close friends. At the same time, we, we, we say we love them, but at the same time, we hate or we dislike them. But on the account of today's lesson, we want to watch out our sinful nature whenever this attack comes to us. Whenever this unwanted temptation infiltrated us, Lord, please give us your discernment, your sharp knowledge and wisdom based on your words. We want to drive them out. We can drive them out, not on our own, but with the power, with the words from you. Our life is rooted in your foundation, Lord. We are not on our own. We are yours. Lord, please take us. So, please to use us, Lord. And We don't want to live like Cain. So, uh, through this example, we want to have good attitude. We want to have beautiful mind when it comes to worshiping you. So we want to give you the first and the very best thing. And you are our top priority. Dear Lord, your Lordship, your sovereignty in our life forever last. And also we depend on the power of the blood of Jesus. This Jesus is shed upon our sin to remove, to eliminate 100% so that we can see you with righteousness, with faith, Though we are sinners, but we are called to be righteous because of you and your love and your power, Lord. Lord, now we are going through big tunnel, very dark tunnel, where, but we want to be fighting a good fight. walking with you Lord as we walk this life with you please empower us and please show us your way what to do where to go whom to meet no worries no fear factors whenever we feel in the love of God I do ask in your holy and precious name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. May the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.